Hi, I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and we're going to talk about intramedullary spinal masses. We have no significant disclosures to report. When we consider intramedullary lesions, we talk about traumatic, vascular, inflammatory, and neoplastic lesions. The most common neoplasms of the spinal cord are intrinsic glial tumors, especially the ependymoma. They will typically cause expansion of the spinal cord within the subarachnoid space that can be seen on MR, CT, and in the older days on myelography. The cell of origin for the ependymoma is the ependymal epithelial cell, which forms the lining of the lateral ventricle and the lining of the central canal of the spinal cord. We want to remember that the central canal of the cord and its ependymal lining extends all the way down through the phylum terminale in the area called the cauda equina. While less than 3% of intracranial primary neoplasms are ependymoma, and these most commonly present in children, approximately 60% of spinal cord neoplasms are ependymoma, and these typically present in adult patients. The most common lesion that we see in the conus medullaris and phylum terminale is going to be the mixopapillary ependymoma. So the most common neoplasms of the cord are gliomas and the most common subtype are the ependymoma. And these may occur anywhere within the cord but tend to predominate in the cervical cord in adult patients and also in the area of the conus medullaris. Ependymomas are slowly growing tumors. They are very commonly complicated by microvascular changes that produce blood products that can cause T2 shortening and susceptibility changes, oftentimes described as the hemosiderin cap. The tumors are also able to distort the flow of spinal fluid through the central canal and may be associated with polar cysts above and below an enhancing mass which represents the solid portion of the tumor. Because they are typically within the central portion of the cord and are very well demarcated, they are oftentimes resectable. Here is a classic example of an adult patient with a cervical spinal cord ependymoma. We can see the solid portion of the tumor has gadolinium contrast enhancement. We see a fluid-filled portion of the lesion, which may represent enlargement of the central canal as a syringohydromyelia. And there is also abnormal signal intensity in the spinal cord below the lesion. Looking at the cross-sectional images, again we see a centrally located mass within the spinal cord and one that appears to be very well demarcated. At surgery, ependymomas are oftentimes described as sausage-like masses, very, very smooth. We can see here in the resected specimen something that really does look just like a sausage, very, very well demarcated lesion. In a different patient, we can see here this cross-section of the spinal cord shows a sharply demarcated central lesion. We can imagine that that would be the similar appearance to our patient that we just reviewed. Histologically, ependymomas are characterized by the formation of perivascular pseudorosettes. There is a ring of cells that has processes oriented in a radial fashion towards the capillary in the center. Here is another example of a cervical spinal cord ependymoma in an adult patient. The fluid-filled portion is centered at approximately uh, the vertebral body of C2. We can see the cord is somewhat enlarged. When we look at these three axial sections, we can see that there is hypointensity representing hemosiderum that surrounds the fluid-filled space that represents the tumor and an associated secondary syringohydromyelia. Some people like to call this hemosiderin as opposed to hemosiderin, but it is a hemosiderin rim. And again, we can see in cross-section a very well demarcated mass in the center of the spinal cord, and we can see in the cross-section from our patient that we have this well demarcated lesion roughly in the center of the spinal cord where the central canal should be located. The ventricle and the central canal of the spinal cord are like Las Vegas. What starts in Vegas stays in Vegas, and what starts in the central canal or in the ventricles tends to stay within the ventricles and in the central canal. Here is a third example of a cervical spinal cord ependymoma, and once again we see a centrally located lesion, and we can see at the top and bottom of the lesion the hypointensity caused by hemosiderin from the microvascular change. Classic appearance for a cervical spinal cord ependymoma with a hemosiderin rim. 
When we see ependymomas that are related to the conus medullaris and phylum terminale, they are oftentimes a subtype of ependymoma that is called the myxopapillary ependymoma. Myxopapillary ependymomas represent in some series only 13%, but in other series more than half of spinal cord ependymomas. They may produce multiple lesions and they can cause expansile remodeling of the lumbosacral canal, and they may even extend out of the canal into the extradural space, forming presacral mass. We can see here a fairly typical example of an intraspinal mass lesion. It's associated with a fluid collection. It is centrally located within the bony spinal canal. When the door was opened, we could see the lesion through the arachnoid. We can see here the lesion consists of multiple papilla. Indeed, the tumor is called a myxopapillary ependymoma because the ependymal cells produce a mucus-like secretion, shown here with the stars. And the tumor also is organized into cellular processes that look like papilla, hence the name myxopapillary ependymoma. Here is another example of a lumbosacral myxopapillary ependymoma. It's arising from the tip of the conus medullaris and extending down behind lumbar vertebral bodies 2 through 4 with a fluid component or a cyst uh, behind the vertebral body of L5. And again, there is expansile remodeling of the lumbosacral spinal canal. The tumors are oftentimes described as being soft, plastic or caulk-like lesions, and the, because they grow slowly, the spine is able to remodel around these lesions. Here is an even larger example of a myxopapillary ependymoma coming off the tip of the conus medullaris and producing significant expansile remodeling and concave erosion of the dorsal aspects of the lumbar and sacral vertebral bodies. And we can see here in the same patient in the cross-sectional imaging how the tumor is extending out laterally into the sacrum, presumably following along the subarachnoid space of the root sleeves around the exiting sacral nerves. This has been Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and I approve this message.